everyone. We're going to uh, finish up our series uh, looking at the story of Elijah. And we've been calling this series Peaks and Valleys because I think as you study the passage of 1 Kings 17 through 19, uh, you see just this amazing journey of Elijah, all of these wonderful, magnificent, miraculous things that are happening. But underneath it all, there are, are some, um, some, you know, depressing and discouraging moments in Elijah's life. And I think it's been a helpful look for us to be able to separate some of the things of our understanding of the things that we do for God and yet how we feel at times. And throughout our spiritual lives, I think we will find peaks and valleys in our own journey, our own personal spiritual walks. And, you know, sometimes life does not always end up the way that we think it is, right? There's this phrase uh, that I heard actually this week when I was speaking to someone um, at, at, at work. Um, you know, the, this is the, the one of our leaders in, in Peru, and he has a staff of three people that are, you know, working to end violence against women and children in this whole country. And, uh, you know, originally the, the budget and the plan was for him to have 12 to 14 staff by this point, but it's just three of them. So they're all wearing many different hats. And so I asked him sort of, you know, what encouragement he has, you know, taken from this time. And he said, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Right? And, and so here's this, you know, Peruvian man who's quoting this back to me, right? And I thought it was actually pretty applicable to what our understanding, our understanding of, of Elijah's life and also of our own understanding of how we come into these peaks and valleys with the Lord. In other words, we make the best of whatever situation we are in. Today we want to end up this series with really sort of looking at some very practical, almost everyday, pretty mundane things that we can do as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And I think that these sort of mundane things that we're going to see here will actually help us in our own daily walk as we go about our spiritual lives, but I think also as we go into week to week coming in, attending church, and you know, being in this situation where we don't necessarily know what the, the future holds. We don't know sort of where God may be, where we can find God week to week. This may be very practical things for us to be able to, to, to hold on to as we look forward. Well, as we think through our spiritual lives, as we think through the history of our spiritual lives, what, what sort of struggles and, and times and seasons of your life where things didn't quite add up, that, that things don't, God doesn't really show up the way that we think he, he will? How do we respond to that? How do we, as Christians, as followers of God, how do we typically respond to that? Do we, do we give up? Do we get mad? Do we dive into the Word? Do we, do we sin or do we get depressed? Do we get angry at the people around us? What are ways that we respond? As we look in, in 1 Kings 19 today, we're going to see how Elijah responds, how Elijah himself was able to respond during this time. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first part of Elijah uh, in 1 Kings 19. But this is right after the showdown at Mount Carmel in, verse, in chapter 18, where he challenges Ahab. Um, you know, this is the journey for him. Is he ch challenging Ahab about the drought? He's getting fed by ra ravens. He's, you know, pr performing miracles of food for this widow and the son. He resurrects this young boy back to life. He's beaten the prophets of Baal and Asherah in a fiery showdown. And yet things still don't work out for him. And we're going to review this in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, the first couple of verses says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. 
So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Now, we, this is a passage that we read a couple weeks ago, but I think it's actually interesting that here God tells Elijah in this midst of this depression, in this sort of confrontation with what he is feeling after this, you know, coming down the mountain, figuratively and literally coming down from the mountain of this showdown, the, what God tells Elijah to do is to get up and eat. He tells him, he's like, shakes him awake, and he's like, hey, hey, get up and eat. And he looks around, and he sees this baked bread. You know, it, it reminds me of those times where you go into a restaurant, and you're just famished, but you realize that, you know, like the, the restaurant's busy and this and that. Like, you know, it's probably going to be 30 more minutes before you get your food. And then they come in with the, you know, the hot baked bread that's wrapped in the napkin, right? Like it's that sort of, that sort of satisfaction, right, that you get. This is what I'm reading in, in 1 Kings 19, right? Elijah gets this baked bread from God. And, you know, this is actually supernatural food that God has given to Elijah twice in 1 Kings 19. But it's actually the third instance of God providing supernatural food. You remember in 1 Kings 17 where God brings food with the ravens. The ravens are dropping morsels of food for Elijah. And then you remember later on in that chapter where the, the widow has no more flour and oil. This is our last meal. And Elijah says, but make bread for me and for your son. And the, the flour and the oil doesn't run out until the, the drought is finished. So you see, this is God providing for Elijah consistently, day to day. This is God providing the very basic necessities of his life. Even when he looks around and there's no food and there's no way that he's going to be, you know, there's no reason for him to feel well fed and taken care of, God still provides for him. And in different ways, too. And so, you know, this is, this is God being sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Korean mother in, in our families of like saying, you know, hey, did you eat? Did you eat? Like if you're feeling depressed, did you eat? Get up and eat. Here, I made you something, right? Like this is God sort of saying, hey, I want to take care of your basic necessities. And it's actually on the strength of this eating that Elijah travels 40 days and 40 nights into Horeb or Mount Sinai. God recognizes that dependence that we have on God manifests itself in the physical things. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, uh, it says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So the first thing we see here that Elijah does is he eats. God provides food for himself. And so one of the very basic things that we need to understand, I think the principle here, is what we can do when we're in the midst of a situation where we don't feel God, where we don't understand where God is in our lives, is we can eat. And I think in the passage here, this, this verb eat is really a way for, for Elijah to say, take care of yourself. Maintain your daily healthy habits. Sustain yourself on the basic necessities of life, but also of your spiritual life. It's times where we feel depressed, where we add in all of these unhealthy habits, right? We stay up late, we watch unhealthy TV, we, we, we you know, cr uh, surf the internet and look at all sorts of different things that, that aren't healthy, that aren't sustaining us, that actually plunge us further into depression. It sort of further feeds the algorithm, right? Maybe it's time for us to be able to put the TV off or to put our phone down or to, you know, turn off YouTube or get off of social media, right? There's a way in which the algorithm sort of feeds into this unhealthy cycle. And so this verb eat, I think, is just a simple way to say we need to take care of ourselves. We need to monitor the main daily habits that we do each and every day. So that's the first part for us is, is taking care of ourselves. The second part 
of this comes from verse 8, which we read. It says, so he got up and ate and drank, strengthened that by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, Horeb is another word for Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where Moses saw the burning bush where he received the Ten Commandments, where God passed by in Exodus chapter 33. It says, there's a place uh, near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is God passing by Moses. And as a result of God passing by Moses, Moses' face gets, you know, shiny and, you know, because it's glowing with the radiance of the Lord's presence. But what's interesting here is that, that Elijah goes to Horeb, the Mount Sinai, and he was saying, go to me, go to God in a sense, right? Elijah gets up and he goes, he moves from where he is and he finds the place where God is is. He wasn't just telling him just to get up and go and to leave, but he was saying, go to God. Go to where you know I will be, where God first appears to his people. So he doesn't want to just get us up, uh, up and go anywhere, to leave anywhere, but actually go directionally to where we believe God to be. And so during the seasons of disappointment, during the seasons of depression or of doubt, it's important for us to be able to get up and go to where we believe God will be. And so, you know, the daily practices of where we think God will be will be in the Word of God. Getting up and going into the Word of God, reading God's Word. It may be getting up and going back into your community, reaching out to your Christian community, your small group, your community group, and saying, hey, I'm struggling here. Can you sustain me? Can you pray for me? Getting up and going to church to attend church on Sundays. It could be getting up and de developing the discipline of going to where we believe God will meet us. So, it's not just turning inward and just laying on our bed, sitting on our couch, and just waiting for God to sort of show up. But there's a way that when we get up and we go, travel somewhere to find out where God is. When your life gets you down or depressed or discouraged, go to God. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Which is interesting, right? When you think about this, we've probably read this passage before. But Jesus doesn't just say, hey, if you're weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. What he says is, come to me and I'll give you rest. And so there's an activity part of it for us to be able to be involved in our daily activities, in the very mundane things that we do day in and day out. First Kings continues Verse 9 says, and the word of the Lord came to him, where, right? He goes to Mount Sinai. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This is just like Exodus 33. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. What's interesting here is that it's not the wind, it's not the earthquake, it's not the fire, it's not the total eclipse, right? I mean, you, know, you think about, you know, just like reading the news here, right? So it's not the wind, it's not the earthquake, and it's not the fire, but it's in the low whisper, the gentle whisper. It's a gentle little breeze. 
where he finds God's presence. One of the translations calls it the sound of sheer silence. It's the, it's the power in that silence. You know, living here in New Jersey, one of the things that I love about uh, being here in the Northeast is, is when it snows. Um, I love when it snows and it's like that fluffy snow that covers everything. And when you go outside, it, it feels extra silent, right? Because everything is coated in this soft, you know, like styrofoam. And so everything is like soundproof. And so when you go outside, it's like the true sound of silence. I love that sound, and I believe that, that what we're seeing here in 1 Kings 19 is a little bit like that. It's like this powerful silence, puncturing silence, which is interesting, right? Because it's not in the wind. It's not in the earthquake. It's not in the fire. It's not in the resurrection of this boy. It's not in the being fed by the ravens. It's not in the fiery, you know, uh, sacrifice on Mount Carmel where we find God's presence. It's in the sound of silence, the gentle breeze, where we can find God's presence. And I think, you know, a lot of times as I look back on my life, and I think through all the times where I have been struggling to find God's presence, I think if I go back and I look at my prayers during those times, I'm praying for wind. I'm praying for earthquakes. I'm praying for fire. I'm praying for God to break through and, and manifest himself in a way that is undeniable, that is shaking the ground underneath my spiritual life. And more often than not, it doesn't really come that way. It comes in sort of the daily discipline of mundane activities, in the sounds of silence where God shows up and reveals himself to me. You see, God can do miraculous things. He can do the fiery sacrifice and feed, fed by ravens and resurrecting uh, the child. God can do those things. But God is also found in the gentle breezes of our lives. We cannot sustain ourselves only on the miraculous events of our life. He is the God of the Mount Carmel, but he is also the God of Mount Sinai. He's the God of Mount Carmel, the fiery sacrifice, but he's also the God of Mount Sinai, the gentle whisper. You have to trust God when he is loud, and you have to trust God when he is silent. You trust him when it is clear, and you trust him when it is murky. You trust God when it is raining, and you trust God when there is a drought. So the prescription for us is to listen. Listen for God, even in the silence. Attune our ears, not just when God's presence is shouting in, in our faces, but when it is quiet in ourselves as well. Psalm 139 says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. No matter where we go, no matter where we find ourselves in life, on the highs of Mount Carmel or on the lows of being in the valley, we can find God. We can find God's presence. If we listen for God. We end 1 Kings 19 in this passage. And it says, The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of, uh, over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped from the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped from the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed and whose mouths have not kissed, uh, have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So you see here, what's interesting is that in verse 15, God shows up to Elijah. Elijah's complaining, I'm the only one left. I'm all alone. And then God says, okay, I'm going to pass by. And he passes by in this whisper. And he says, what are you doing here? And he says the exact same thing. I'm all alone. 
Every prophet has abandoned you. Everyone is gone. And then God shows up and he says, I want you to go back and I want you to anoint these three. I want you to anoint king over Aram, king over Israel, and Elisha, a prophet. Which is interesting, right? Because Elijah just said, there's no one left. He just said, I'm the only one left. It's all on me. And God says, look around. There's actually other people. And later on in 1 Kings, you'll see that God actually has preserved 7,000 people who never bowed to Baal. And so Elijah thinks he's all alone. He thinks that, that the world is caving in on around him. But as he looks around, he sees not only three leaders, Elisha who will succeed Elijah, but also 7,000 other people who have not bowed down to Baal. And so you see these three and 7,000, Elijah was not alone. What Elijah thought was his situation, the thing that was actually depressing him, God tells him, hey, look around. You're, what you are reacting to, what you are feeling is not the reality of your situation. I have preserved people around you. I have preserved your situation. So God's prescription is for Elijah is to look, to look around and recognize that you are not alone, to recognize that you are not alone in your feeling of desperation or discouragement, that you're surrounded by a community of people that God has preserved, that no matter how alone you may feel in your life, if you look around enough and pray that God would reveal those that he has preserved, God will will show you community around you. I remember when I was uh, pastoring, uh, many times people would uh, come up to me and they say, you know, pastor, I, I think we're going we're gonna to leave the church. And I say, okay, well, you know, tell me more about that. Like, tell me what's going on. Well, we just, we just don't have community here in the church. You know, usually this would be happening in the fellowship hall, right? While there's like 150 people like surrounding like this, you know, vibrant community of people talking and laughing and, and this and that. And so like the juxtaposition of people saying in this room of 150 people to say we have no community. I say, okay, well, tell me more what, what you're feeling. And they, what they say is, you know, we just don't feel connected to people. We just don't, you know, feel like we have any friends here. We don't have any, you know. And, and, and inevitably what I would ask them is, you know, in what, what, what venues are you looking for this community? What, how would you know that you have community? What are the, the signs and the markers that you would have this community? And I would ask them, like, what have you done? What steps have you taken to establish that community? What groups have you joined? What activities have you participated in? What, in what ways have you created a community for others? Right? It's this idea of, of eating, going, listening, looking, right? The, the ways that we take care of ourselves, getting up and leaving our place of comfort to go and find out where God may be, to listening to the way that God is speaking amidst our situation, and then looking around and establishing and understanding that there are people around us that actually may be that answer to prayer. Now, you and your situation here at, at RCC, this has been, you know, now years without a senior pastor. And you may feel like, you know what, I, I, I feel like I'm a little bit like in the ravine. I feel like uh, I'm, I'm alone. Like I feel like I'm just sort of just hanging on. And you feel alone. The encouragement for you may be to actually look around. To listen to God in the sheer silence of the drought. To be consistent with your, your going to God and, and how you take care of yourself in these sort of daily activities. That we pray together, that we serve together, that we commune together, that we fellowship together. If we partake in these activities, you may find that God will sustain you in this time of a drought. Eating, going, listening, and looking. Now, these are not super spiritual things for you, right? And if you came to me and you said, like, hey, I'm not really feeling God's presence in my life. And I said, well, you just need to, you know, eat, go, listen, and look, right? Like, you would be like, well, that's, 
That doesn't really sound like very helpful advice. And yet, I do think that there's an emphasis that we place on the supernatural, the, the, the fireworks of our lives, the, the, the Mount Carmels, the, the, the miraculous events in our life. And we, we don't pay attention as much to the mundane. And I think oftentimes it is in the sheer silences and the gentle breezes of our life where God can be found during times like this. If God is going to be God of the marvelous, he must also be the God of the mundane. If God is going to be the God of Mount Carmel, he's going to be also the God of Mount Sinai. It has to be this way. Because we cannot live our life just chasing after the marvelous. We must sustain it during these times of the mundane. If God is going to be the God of the extravagant, he's going to be the God of the everyday as well. If God is going to be God of the peaks, he's going to be God of the valleys as well. As you think about your situation, maybe your own personal spiritual life, but maybe also this moment in time for you as a church and your participation in as a church, This is a time for us to say, God, we believe that you're the God of the miraculous, but we also acknowledge that you're God of the mundane, that you are the God of the peaks, and you are also the God of the valleys. And so it's understanding that God's perspective, God's relationship, our relationship with God doesn't change depending on whether we are in a peak or a valley, but our relationship with God sustains itself remains consistent because of who God is and his character, not our circumstances, not our victories, not our what we're feeling, but the sustaining remaining situation is because of who God is to us in every situation, no matter where we may find ourselves today. Let's pray. Let's just take a moment. Just pray and respond to the Lord. You may hear him speaking to you and just challenging you with this truth. Just take a moment to respond and then I'll pray for us. Lord, we recognize that you are the God of the miraculous, that we celebrate the God of the miraculous. We tell stories about that. We read Bible passages about the miraculous. And yet, God, we also acknowledge today that you are the God of the mundane. You're God of the everyday. That you are the God of the fire and the earthquakes and the wind, but you're also the God of the silence. You're God of the, the gentle breezes in our life. And so, Lord, we pray that during this these seasons of silence, these seasons of waiting, these seasons of not knowing, seasons of doubt, discouragement, that you would sustain us, that you would reveal yourself to us, that we would take the simple steps to eat and go and listen and look to take care of ourselves, to get up and go to where we, we will find you, to listen to your voice in the silence, and that we would look around and notice those that you have sustained around us. God, I pray that you would encourage us in these seasons of peaks and valleys, individually and also as a church. Amen.
to leave you with a blessing that comes from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, which says this. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.